Happy Sabbath, everyone. I would like to welcome each and everyone who is joining us through this social uh, live stream uh, Sabbath service. I would like to read a verse from uh, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 29. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Uh, this is a promising verse that uh, says that God gives uh, strength to the weak. I think uh, this is again a beautiful verse at this uh, testing times that we face. Uh, let's uh, close our eyes for our opening prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day that has blessed us. Lord, we are grateful for the life that you've given us. We are grateful for the food and blessings that you provide us each day, oh Father. Lord, uh, we would like to thank you for all the blessings that you've given our uh, church members, our friends and relatives also, Father, Lord. We also uh, pray for the sick and the needy right now. Please be with them and guide them. Help them in whatever ways uh, is possible, oh Father. Lord, give us the opportunity to be a blessing to others through these social platforms or any means that is required. Help us to open our hearts uh, to welcome the sick and the needy, oh Father. Lord, as we enter into the Sabbath services, please be with us and guide us. Help us to learn more about you and spread your gospel at this time, oh Father. I pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. the 
Lord, I lift your name on high. Name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. To save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. You came from heaven to earth to show the way. From the earth to the cross, my debts to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. You came from heaven to earth to show the way. From the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on
Happy Sabbath Church. Today's mission report comes from Poland. One bad decision. There were seven inmates who were ready to be baptized in the prison of Poland. But how and where to be baptized was a question to Pastor Marius. Finally, he came up with an idea that he will baptize the prisoners in the Baltic Sea in an upcoming meeting. Pastor Marius requested the prison warden to release the inmates for four days, one day to travel by train to the sea, two days for the camp meeting. According to Polish law, the inmates who exhibit good character and completed the two-thirds of their sentences are allowed to leave the are allowed to leave the prison for a short period. The warden granted permission for the six of the seven inmates. And another inmate, Jurek, heard about this and decided that he also wanted to be joined in the baptism. The train ride was a very good occasion as they sang Christian songs. As the train arrived at the station, Jurek sh didn't show up. On Sabbath, the six in inmates were bapti baptized in the Baltic Sea. Jurek did not return to the prison, and their warrant was issued for his arrest. As Jurek did not get a job, he holds up with some cr criminal friends and joined fo and forced his 17-year-old brother to join in the cr crime. After the police hung, Jurek and his brother were jailed. For 20 years, Jurek's story bothered Marius, and if he had only been baptized, he would have been boarded on the train. One day, a female church member approached Marius in Lublin as he was serving as a pastor. Her sister was dating a prisoner who needs help. Pastor Marius met with a man, Tomek, who harbored deep resentment toward God. Tomek shared his bad experiences of life to Pastor Marius and how he was born in a dysfunctional family. Pastor Marius spoke about a single bad decision. While he was uh, taking a Bible study for Tomek, he remembered about Jurek's story and told about Jurek. Tomek started crying and said that I, I confessed that he was Jurek's brother. Tomek is now planning to get baptized and trying to stop drinking. In Isaiah 55 verse 6 says, Seek the Lord while he may be here. He may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Thank you for attending Sabbath offering in 2017. It was privilege for the television and hope channel in Poland. Thank you. So they paid the fare and went into Tashish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent a great wind to the sea and there was a mighty temper in the sea so that the ship was like to be broken. So the people in the ship cried out unto his God and cast forth the wall and was in the ship into the sea and lightened it on them. But Jonah was gone down into the sea and lay and was fast asleep. The shipmaster came down to him and tell, O you sleeper, arise upon thy God, if, if so, that God will be, will not leave us to perish. And everyone made a lot, and so the lot fell on Jonah. So they prayed that if they would throw Jonah, that the innocent blood, the sins would not fall on them. And the Lord and the people asked to Jonah, From where are you? When are you coming? And which country are you? For what people are thou? 
and he said unto them, I am Hebrew, I fear the God of heaven, which made the sea and the dry land. They were the men exceedingly afraid unto them. Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he flee from the presence of the Lord, and told them, then said unto him, What shall we do, that the sea may come for us? So the sea was tempered, and they said, oh, They said, Take me out and throw me into the sea, so that the sea will come. So as the people of the ship took Jonah and threw him out, and the fish swallowed him. So he was in the fish for three days and three nights. So the word of the Lord also come to us today. We are also in the storms today. So we need to ask God's presence. Unless we ask the presence of the Almighty God, because he is the Alpha and Omega and the beginning and the end. He is a true and a living God. He will protect us in the times of storm. May the good Lord bless you and keep you. Amen. Happy Sabbath and good morning to each of you for joining us for lesson study. And although we are separated by distance, I'm happy that we're able to connect through technology that God has blessed us with. And uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Worldwide Church is studying the subject of how to interpret scripture or the subject of hermeneutics. And so if you want to follow us along, um, uh, 
go to absg.adventist.org. That's absg.adventist.org. And we are in lesson 5, entitled, By Scripture Alone, Sola Scriptura. And uh, before we go any further, I want to uh, greet my friends back on the high street, uh, English Seventh-day Adventist Church, uh, the church that I used to attend while I was back home. And uh, before we go any further, we also want to um, ask God for His Spirit uh, to be given to us that we may understand the Bible. Let's pray and join with me wherever you are. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this um, privilege to study your Word. And as we study Lesson 5 of our quarterly um, Sola Scriptura, help us to understand what this means to our own personal lives. And we pray for the blessing of the Holy Spirit that He may bring things to remembrance and help us grasp the things that you want us to grasp. And I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Three years ago, that is in 2017, the Protestant world uh, celebrated 500 years of Reformation. And... Uh, the battle cry of the Protestant Reformation, writes one author, um, is to judge all faith and practice by Scripture alone. And this battle cry, to judge all faith and practice by Scripture alone, is relevant to our day and age as it has always been throughout the history of this world. And I also like how one author, uh, Dr. Trim, uh, writes about about this. He writes in the book Understanding Scripture, Volume 1, page 3 and 4, The Reformation of the 16th century was first and foremost a hermeneutical reformation. It was able to shake the authority of the Roman Catholic Church and generate an enduring ecclesiastical reformation. Martin Luther broke with many medieval extra-biblical traditions and with the Roman Catholic hermeneutical hegemony, thereby allowing the Bible to speak directly to every believer. The Bible was restored to its central place through the principles of sola scriptura, the exclusiveness of scripture, and tota scriptura, the totality of scripture, once more, the scriptures were allowed to interpret themselves through the historical grammatical method, and their prophetic apocalyptic elements began to explain the ongoing history of the Christian church using the historicist approach. And so, the Protestant Reformation happened because of the hermeneutical reformation if the bible lost if the bible was not uh, brought back to its original place if it was not restored to its uh, central place the protestant reformation would never have happened and who knows what the course of history would have been who knows if the dark ages would have prolonged and so the dark ages is a showcase to the world uh, of what happens when the scripture is not the central focus, when the Bible is not given the place it has to be given. And so having that said, we want to go into our a lesson and we want to understand what this by scripture alone means to our church, what this scripture alone means to an individual, to families and to the society we live in. I'm looking at the Sunday's portion, uh, and uh, it's entitled, Scripture as the Ruling Norm. Scripture as the Ruling Norm. And I just want to read that, uh, read a small portion from our lesson study book. It tells, from their beginning, from our beginning, the Seventh-day Adventist Church have considered themselves to be the people of the book, that is, Bible-believing Christians. To affirm the biblical principles of Sola Scriptura, we acknowledge the unique authority of the Bible and that the Bible is authoritative. And what does this mean uh, in our day-to-day -day lives? What does this mean to our families and to our church? First of all, 
Sola Scriptura means that the Word of God is truth. Uh, if you turn your Bibles to John chapter 17 and verse 17, the Bible tells the following. It tells, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Sanctify them through thy truth and thy word is truth. Truth. The Bible defines what truth is and it claims that it is truth. You know, we live in an age and uh, it's increasing the, uh, the, the mindset that there is no authoritative truth, there is no absolute truth is increasing day after day, especially in my generation. And in an age such as this, the Bible makes this bold claim that it is truth. And so when the Bible tells us, by scripture alone, it means the Bible is truth. And the Bible is the standard of truth. Second, when the Bible tells, or the saying, by scripture alone, it means that the Bible is the standard of truth and everything else has to be measured by the truth from the Bible. Uh, Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20 tells this. It tells, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. This passage is essentially saying, that the Bible is objective and not subjective to anything else. You know, last week we looked at um, the Bible as the authoritative source of theology. And we looked at uh, uh, human tradition, culture, reason, experience, uh, how they have their role, but they are not authoritative when compared to the Bible. The Bible is supreme and authoritative and all the others are uh, subjective to the Word of God. And everything else has to be evaluated by the Bible and the Bible alone. Now we see this uh, example, there are several examples in the Bible that is given of how the Bible is objective and everything else is subjective to the uh, Word of God. You know, in Isaiah chapter 8, verses 19 and 20, we see how Isaiah warns apostate Israel, telling them not to go to uh, spirit mediums to find truth, but instead to... Uh, to see if those spirit mediums uh, speak the truth by testing it with the word of God. And we see that in Isaiah chapter 8 verses 19 and 20. And uh, we also see scripture over tradition and tradition of the religious authorities even. You now Jesus speaks how the word of God is authoritative above uh, tradition and even the tradition of religious institutions. Now, tradition in and of itself is nothing wrong as long as it does not conflict with the teachings of the Bible. And so the Bible uh, is also over human philosophy. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8, Paul warns about human philosophy and the Bible is uh, objective to human philosophy. And also in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 20, uh, science is... Paul talks about science and uh, he tells how to be careful of uh, knowledge or science depending on the translation you're reading from. And he tells, uh, essentially he's implying that the teachings of the Bible are objective to uh, science. And you know, we live in a day and age where there are people who believe anything and everything else. And uh, they say the earth is flat. Uh, they say that uh, the six day literal, the six literal day creation is not applicable anymore, and so on and so forth, based upon science. And but what do we do at those times? You know, do we uh, stick with the word of God as our ultimate authority, or do we give in to science? Or maybe you sit in the classroom, and uh, the textbook or the teacher in the university is saying, you know, that we evolved. And uh, whereas the Bible tells us that you and I are created in the image of God, what do we do at that time when, the, when science and Bible is in conflict? No, the Bible ought to be authoritative. We ought to view science. We ought to view philosophy. We ought to view any 
everything and everything else or tradition for that matter through the lens of scripture. We need to interpret those things through the lens of scripture and not the other way around. And also we find that scripture is over human reason and emotions. You know, uh, we see Eve. Uh, she was deceived by what she saw. I mean, Satan is the one who essentially did that. But if she stuck with the word of God, if she had the faith in the word of God and did not doubt the word of God, she could have saved herself from sin. In fact, this entire world from sin. If she only remembered that the word of God is objective and her uh, and her taste buds and what she is seeing is subjective or should be subjective to the word of God. I like how um, Luke records of these people in Acts chapter 17 verses 10 and 11. It tells, And the brethren immediately sent away into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Now these Bereans um, did not just sit in the pews of the church and just uh, take in what the preacher preached. Uh, they went back to their houses and they verified if what the preacher preached was in accordance to the word of God. And the same thing with us. You, know, you may be listening to so many sermons online. You may be listening to or watching so many videos online. Or you may be talking to a friend or with a preacher. Or you may be sitting in your online class. Uh, whatever it may be, you need to bring all that we hear see in the classroom, in the church, uh, the conversation under scrutiny of the word of God, of the Bible. And that's what it means by scripture alone. First of all, it means that the scripture contains truth, that it stands by itself. It does not need anything else to support its stand because it is truth. Second of all, it means that um, everything else ought to be tested by the Bible. And uh, if it is in harmony with the Bible, we follow it, we practice it. If it is not in harmony with the Bible, we don't follow and we don't practice that. You know, the Dark Ages, like I said earlier, is a showcase of what happens when tradition is above Scripture. You know, uh, it affects our society at large, it affects our families, and it affects our individuals. But also, on the reverse of it, we see what happens when the Bible is the authoritative uh, source by which tradition is even judged. You know, uh, there is happiness, and uh, there is restoration of what mankind should really be. Uh, me and my friend uh, Samuel are studying with a uh, dear lady, preparing her for a baptism. And uh, she recently got in touch with these Mormons. And, uh, you know, in trying to evangelize them over to the Seventh-day Adventist Church, she asked the question, uh, why do you keep Sunday as Sabbath and not Saturday? And they said that uh, the apostles changed the Sabbath and uh, so many other reasons. She called me up one Sunday evening and she told me uh, this is all happening and I don't quite know all the answers. If you can, please help me uh, with that. And so if you can join me on a phone call, on a conference call with these Mormon missionaries and myself, that would be amazing. And so me, uh, I promised and my friend joined me uh, on this study with these Mormons. And so the, the discussion began. And the discussion went, um, you know, I, I, I started first and I said, I gave all the reasons why we keep the seventh day as the Sabbath. And these dear Mormon missionaries, they went, uh, they went to the scripture and uh, basically they misquoted it or they misinterpreted it of how the Sabbath was changed from Saturday, from the seventh day to the first day of the week, uh, the apostles changed it. And so the discussion went from Sabbath and to so many other things, and soon we realized that the real issue there is not the Sabbath. The real issue there is not any other doctrine. 
It is, but that is not the root issue. That is not the fundamental issue. But the fundamental issue is that for them, sola scriptura, they don't apply to their lives. You know, for example, you know, when the, you know, when we shared with them how they misinterpreted that verse to prove uh, that the disciples changed the Sabbath, when they could not find a stand in that verse that they uh, initially gave us, they went to the Book of Mormon trying to support what they believe, you see. And the Book of Mormon is in contradiction with the Word of God. And so uh, this, this discussion went for a few hours and then when we realized that the real issue is not the Sabbath and not all the other beliefs, but the Word of God itself, I asked Two questions. I ask, dear friends, I have two questions. The first question is, the Bible is either inspired or it's not inspired by God. The second question, the Bible is authoritative or it is not authoritative. And I'm happy and I'm glad for their honesty. One of the Mormon missionaries said, the Bible is not authoritative. And so when the Bible is not authoritative and the Bible is not uh, uh, standing by itself, when we don't um, test everything else by the word of God, we can get into problems, we can get into confusion. And so it is very important for us to understand that the Bible should be uh, the fundamental source of truth and it is the fundamental source of truth and everything else has to be uh, tested by the word of God. I want to jump over to Tuesday's portion and then we'll come back to Monday's portion. You know, if we have to uh, test everything by the Word of God, if we need to know what is truth, then we need to read the Word of God. You know, without reading it, we will not be able to understand. You know, a person can write me ten, a, a check for 10,000 rupees and uh, just because a person wrote a 10,000 rupees check for me doesn't make me rich if it's just lying in my house for weeks together. I have to take it and cash it in the bank and only then uh, that 10,000 rupees will benefit me. Similarly, you know, God has given to us uh, the riches of His grace, uh, His rich messages in the Bible. And if it's just lying around for several weeks and several days or several years, it's not going to benefit us. And so we have to take the Word of God and read it for for it to benefit our personal lives, our families, and our church. There are many scriptural references uh, that we see in Deuteronomy chapter 30 verses 11 through 14, uh, Luke chapter 1 verses 3 and 4, uh, John chapter 20 verses 30 and 31, uh, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3. All these verses, it encourages us to personally read the Word of God. In in fact, I'll read to you from Revelation chapter 1 and uh, verse 3. And you can uh, reference all the other scriptures at your uh, leisure. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3 tells us, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. You know, uh, it specifically talks about the book of Revelation, but there are so many passages throughout Scripture which encourages us to personally read the Word of God. Uh, I like how uh, one author puts it. It assumes the priesthood of all believers rather than restricting its interpretation to a select few such as the clerical priesthood. Therefore, we are encouraged in the Bible to study the scriptures for ourselves because we are able to understand God's message to us. You know, one of the things that uh, during the dark ages was that the church took the responsibility to interpret scripture and to communicate to the people. And they took away Bibles from the common people and the church took the authority to uh, interpret scripture and that is not right. You know, that is one of the reasons that the Dark Ages uh, existed. But the Bible tells us that the Bible is written not only for the clergy, not only for the seminarian, but for every common person person out there. You may be a doctor, you may be a student, you may be an engineer, 
you may be an accountant, you may be an auxiliary staff, you may be a farmer, no matter what your background is, whatever your profession is, the Bible is written for you. In fact, the Bible was written by common people, not just uh, seminarians. But when we read the Word of God, we also ought to understand that we cannot understand the Word of God by ourselves. We need the, um, the work of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 16, verse 13 and 14, we see Jesus promising the disciples uh, the, the Holy Spirit when we ask. Uh, Ellen White writes that we should never, I'm paraphrasing it, that never should the Bible be studied without prayer, inviting the Holy Spirit, because it is a divine book. And we will look uh, more into that later on. Also in Tuesday's portion, uh, there are several texts uh, given. Matthew chapter 21, verse 42, Matthew 12, uh, 3 and 5. And there are, there's a list of Bible texts given. And it asks the question, what does Jesus' repeated referral to Scripture imply in regard to the clarity of its message? You know, in all those texts, two or three phrases repeat over and over again. The first one is, have you not read? The second one is, let him that readeth understand. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Have you not read in the Scripture? Did he never read in the Scriptures? What does this imply? It implies that scripture can be understood. It implies that you and I, when we take the word of God, we can understand the word of God. And the Bible is meant for all of us to be understood. Now, when we read the word of God, we also need to understand that the scriptures are to be taken in their plain, literal sense unless a clear and obvious figure is intended. For example, the book of Daniel, you, know, you start from Daniel chapter 1, we talk about how the captives were brought to Babylon. I mean, those things you take uh, literally, you don't, uh, you, know, you don't try to look into the symbolism of that and so on and so forth. But you come to Daniel chapter 2, we see that the king is having a dream. You know, you take it literally that the king is having a dream. But then, the king has his dream of this statue Head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron and feet of iron and clay. And this stone comes out of nowhere. It comes and uh, uh, hits the bottom of the uh, statue and the statue goes into pieces. And then the stone which hit the statue, it covers the whole earth. You know, there is... Uh, obvious symbolism that is intended there. You know, it, it doesn't usually happen in, in our day-to-day -day lives. And so at that time, we have to realize that it is symbolic. And uh, when it is symbolic, what do we do? We will see later on what do we do when we find symbolism in the Bible. In fact, in Daniel chapter 2, the king demands to tell him the dream and the interpretation the reason that he wants interpretation, it's because it's not an ordinary thing. Uh, there is symbolism that is given in the dream. That is why he's asking for interpretation. So you come to Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 3, Daniel chapter 4, Daniel chapter 5, uh, Daniel chapter 6. You know, all those things have to be literally taken. They are not symbolic. But when you come to Daniel chapter 7, all of a sudden you see unusual beasts that we don't see when you go to the zoo. What do you do at that time? At that time, we understand that the Bible is using symbolism to communicate something. The author is using symbolism to communicate something. So when we read the Word of God, we need to take the plain, literal sense unless a clear, obvious figure or symbolism is intended. Also, when we read the Word of God, uh, there is a definite truth intention of the biblical writers in any given statement or book. You know, uh, there is a reason why the author wrote what he wrote. So when we read the Bible, we ought to try understand what the author is trying to communicate. Now, what is the message that he's trying to communicate? And it should not be subjective to uncontrolled multiplicity of meanings. I like how, um, incidentally, there's this 
uh, document interpreting scripture by Dr. Richard M. Davison. If you go to Adventist Biblical Research Institute, if you go to Adventist Biblical Research Institute, and then you go to the materials, you click on that and you search for interp uh, interpretation of scripture by Richard M. Davison, you might be able to find that document. It's an excellent document that I highly recommend and I'm reading to you from the one of the uh, one of the paragraphs it tells this is not to deny that some parts of scripture point beyond themselves typology predictive prophecy symbols and parables to an extended meaning or future fulfillment but even in these cases the extended meaning or fulfillment arises from is consistent with and in fact is an integral part of the specific truth intention of the text and scripture itself indicates the presence of such extended meaning or fulfillment in such cases. What do I mean? When the Bible tells that there was a worldwide flood in the book of Genesis, it, there, there literally was a worldwide flood and that, that is not symbolic. But and that is the intent of the author, that he wants to communicate that there was a worldwide flood and only eight were saved. But when you go to Matthew chapter 24, Jesus uses that as a typology, as a type to indicate that the condition of the earth just before the second coming of Jesus will be same as the condition during the times of Lot and Noah. You know, we see that the application of what was given in Genesis arises from the Bible itself. You see, and it does not stretch the meaning too far. It is very consistent with the original message given. And so, uh, when we read the Word of God, we need to understand that. Coming to Wednesday's portion, you know, sometimes when we read the Word of God, we may not understand certain portions of the Bible. We may not understand certain scriptures. What do we do at that time? I like how Martin Luther put it. Scripture is its own light. When we don't understand one scripture, we got to go to other scriptures on that same subject to understand uh, that subject. Uh, if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verses, uh, chapter 2 and verse 13, it tells, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. Now notice, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. And so there may be a text that you may not be able to understand. What do you do at that time? You know, uh, earlier I pointed to how uh, the king had a dream. And we see this statue, a multi-mineral mineral statue. What do you do when you're not able to understand what that multi-mineral statue means? Do you just make up your own meaning of it? Do you go to other authors to find the meaning of it? No, you go to the Bible itself to find the meaning of it. As you read through Daniel chapter 2, the symbolism is explained in the latter part of Daniel chapter 2. Scripture interpreting scripture. We see Jesus doing the same thing. In Luke chapter 24 and verse 27, it tells, and, the, and beginning at Moses and all the apostles, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Luke 24 verses 44 and 45. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. So Jesus, when he was talking about how he fulfilled uh, the prophecies of the Old Testament, he went to all the prophecies in the Old Testament, all the texts in the Old Testament to make the point he was making. And that also tells us the importance of totality in scripture. You know, when you take the subject, uh, a particular subject, you, know, you need to go through all the references in the Bible on that particular subject, and then you will get a solid, correct understanding of that particular subject. And so interpreting scripture with scripture. But why is it the word of God 
alone should be the standard of truth. Why is it that we ought to understand the word of God and go to the word of God itself to understand when there is uh, some things that we don't understand? The reason is because the Bible makes another tall claim in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. It tells all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. The Bible claims that from Genesis to Revelation, everything is given by the inspiration of God. The Old Testament, uh, with the books of Moses, the major and minor prophets, the Psalms uh, being referred to by Jesus is inspired by God. In the New Testament, uh, the apostolic eyewitness accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and, uh, and the other, uh, other books, well, direct or indirect eyewitness accounts on Jesus and the teachings of Jesus and the books of Paul are inspired by God. And because all scripture is given by the inspiration of God, God is the supreme author. Although there were 40 different authors wrote on three different continents in three different languages over a period of 1,500 years, there is still harmony in the Bible. And so when you take a subject and you study that subject, Say that you want to start, uh, you want to study about, um, study about prayer. No, you go to all the references from Genesis to Revelation on the subject of prayer and then you come to a conclusion. And when you don't understand one verse, you, uh, you consider all other verses in the Bible on that subject to understand that one confusing text. And I hope that is clear. Now coming to our final portion of our lesson study and that is uh, on Thursday's lesson. Sola Scriptura and Ellen G. White. Now oftentimes Adventists are confronted with this question of if the Bible is, uh, is the ultimate source of authority, what about Ellen White? And uh, if Adventists believe in Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone, what about Ellen White? Now you don't believe in Scripture alone is what they ask. Well. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17, one of the marks of God's end time church is that they will have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10, it identifies or it explains what the testimony of Jesus Christ is. That the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy, which means the end time church will have the gift of prophecy, the spirit of prophecy. What we did just now is interpreting scripture by scripture. When we want to understand more about the testimony of Jesus Christ, we went to the scripture itself to understand what the testimony of Jesus Christ is. That's just an example. And so in God's end time church, the gift of prophecy was to be manifested. And who gives the gift of prophecy? It is the Holy Spirit. We see that in Corinthians and in, and in Ephesians, that the Holy Spirit gives many diversity of gifts to the church and one of the gift is the spirit of prophecy and the end time church was to have the manifestation of the gift of prophecy. Now the Seventh-day Adventist church, it understands that Ellen White has the gift of prophecy and the Seventh-day Adventist church does not blindly believe that Ellen White has the gift of prophecy but Ellen White and her writings and uh, her prophetic work is put to the test of biblical prophets. And then it is because she passed those tests that the Seventh-day Adventist Church accepts uh, her ministry as a prophetic gift in the remnant church. If she did not pass those biblical texts, or I mean rather biblical tests, then we would not have uh, accepted her ministry as the prophetic gift for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So even in that, we see that the Bible was the final authority. No, her ministry, her life and teachings, uh, which was given by God, was tested by the Bible only. And also, you know, the early Adventist church history, we see oftentimes people say, oh, Ellen White is the founder of uh, the 1844 message and so on and so forth. Not really. The way it operated was, you know, 
the early pioneers, they studied that subject over and over again through the Bible. No, they used sola scriptura principle. They used the principle of scripture, interpreting scripture. They used the principle of totality of scripture, taking all the scripture into consideration before coming to a conclusion. And then after they studied it thoroughly, then God would give Ellen White a vision. And then God would confirm that what they discovered is truth. And so in closing, I want to read... Uh, a couple of things from our lesson study. The first thing is from the words of Ellen White. Testimonies, Volume 2, uh, page uh, 605. And you will see how Ellen White supported Sola Scriptura principle, Scripture alone principle. You are not familiar with the Scriptures. If you had made God's Word your study with a desire to reach the Bible standard and attain to Christian perfection, you would, you would not have needed the testimonies. It is because you have neglected to acquaint yourself with God's, in with God's inspired book that He sought to reach you by simple, direct testimonies. And then, I'll, I want to read the uh, last paragraph under the titled Sola Scriptura and Ellen White, Thursday's portion, given by the authors of uh, this lesson study. As such, her writings are to be appreciated. They shared the same kind of inspiration as the biblical writers had, but they had a different function than the Bible does. Her writings are not an addition to Scripture, but are subject to Holy Scripture. She never intended her writings to take the place of Scripture. Instead, she elevated the Bible as the only standard for faith and practice. So my friends, the Sabbath, I want to encourage you to take the Word of God in that quiet time by praying to God for the assistance of the Holy Spirit. Read through the pages of Scripture. When you read through the pages of Scripture, realize that it is truth. Realize that God will speak to you personally. You know, I've read many books on the Bible, but it is nothing like taking the Bible for myself and reading through it, realizing that God is actually speaking to me through the Bible. The experience is completely different and it is more satisfying. And so I want to encourage you, whoever you are, Whatever your background is, whatever your age is, take the Word of God, read with the assistance of the Holy Spirit. Thank you so much once again for um, giving me this privilege to study the Bible with you. And may God bless you and have a happy Sabbath and stay safe. Good morning and a very happy Sabbath to all the regular church members, friends and visitors to the online service of the High Street English Church, Bangalore. On behalf of the church pastor, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to everyone present and viewing online. This is the first week of a new month and for many of us, it's already been over a month in lockdown. I praise God for His grace kindness and mercy towards all of us. There may be hundreds, if not thousands of people who do not have the privileges or comforts as we do. Let us thank God for what we have and pray for those people who are struggling for their basic necessities. Let's read a verse from the Bible. Lamentations chapter 3 verse 22 and 23. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. This verse simply tells us that the love of the Lord is unchanging and we experience it every day of our lives. Kindly make note of the announcements and prayer requests. Let's continue praying for all the nurses, doctors and medical staff who are treating COVID-19 patients around the globe. Pray for the families who have lost loved ones due to various reasons including this virus. Pray for the recovery of people infected by COVID-19. 
Pray for the missionaries and gospel workers around the world. Our online service timings are as follow. Vespers at 7 p.m. on Friday. The Sabbath school starts at 9.45 on Saturday morning, followed by the Divine Service at 11 a.m. Now for those interested in Bible study, you can join the online interactive study Corona, Prophecy and Timely Wisdom. This is a series that's hosted by Mr. Vinod Kiran, Dr. Rajkumar and Mr. Deva Kujur between 3 to 4 p.m. It's happening this afternoon and you can tune in. All you need to do is download a free app called Free Conference Call. And inside the app, once you're in there, you join a meeting, enter the meeting ID, Vinod Kiran, and then click only on Call in with data or Wi-Fi. The Bangalore Metro Conference has organized a prayer thon today. So starting at 6 a.m. all the way till 6 p.m., we will be uh, witnessing a prayer thon. There are videos that uh, different churches have posted. You can watch all of these programs right on one of the links that the BMC provides. We will share with share that link with you on the WhatsApp group. Now, for those who would like to give in your tithes and offerings online, please make note of the details projected on the screen. Please mention the category of the transfer, whether it's tithe, birthday, church offering, poor fund, etc. And also don't forget to send a note via WhatsApp to our treasurer, Mr. Nagesh Rao, detailing the transfer. Now thanks. I want to thank all the volunteers who took part in our worship service today. Now we may have a couple more weeks of online services, so if anyone is interested, please do contact the pastor or anybody from the communication department. Our speaker this morning is Mr. Andrew Ben Jacob. He serves as a youth pastor of the Love English Church currently. May God bless him as he breaks the bread of life to us today. May God bless us as we reverently prepare to listen to his word. God bless. Good morning and happy Sabbath children. Today's story is about a donkey. One day, a man was taking his donkey to the market. His donkey was carrying a bag of rice. So as he was walking on the road, he felt tired. So he thought of resting under a tree. He tied his donkey to a nearby tree, but the rope was tied a bit loose. So he took a nap. After he got up, he was surprised to see that his donkey was not there. So he was panicking, he was worried. So he started looking for his donkey. So as he was searching for his donkey, he met a little boy on the way. And he stopped this boy and asked, have you seen my donkey? So the boy said, he asked a few questions to him. Is your donkey's left eye blind? Is his right foot lame? Was he carrying a load of uh, rice? So the man thought to himself, Oh, I found my donkey. So it is somewhere around. And he told this boy, Yes, yes, you're right. That is my donkey that I'm looking for. Where is it? So the boy said, I don't know. The, boy, the man got upset with his little boy. And he said, you said, you described everything right about my donkey. Then how could you say that you have not seen my donkey? You don't know where it is. You are lying. You have actually stolen my donkey. So the boy said, no, I have not stolen your donkey. So they had a little bit of argument. So what this man did, he took this boy to the village chief. And the man explained everything 
about what happened to his donkey. So the village chief asked the little boy, well, you have described everything right about his donkey. And now you're telling that you've not seen the donkey. How is that possible? So the little boy explained, as I was walking on the road, I saw the footprints of the donkey. The left and the right footprints were very different. So with this, I understood that the right foot of the donkey was lame. And the, the, the donkey was eating, the, the donkey had eaten only the, the left side of the grass. So with this, I could make out his right eye was blind. So I saw some grains of rice on the road. So with this, I made out that he was carrying a load of rice, rice bag. So the, the village chief appreciated what he said and he appreciated for his cleverness, for his good thinking. But this man was very sad because he had actually blamed this little boy for stealing his donkey, which he did not do right. Well, children, today you have a very important lesson to learn that we should not judge others. Do not judge others. Well, the Bible tells clearly in Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 to 5 that we are not supposed to judge others. God tells that, you know, why don't you have to clear the beam that is in your eyes before you want to take the speck from your brother's eye. There is only one judge that is God. So all of our actions, words, deeds, everything will brought into judgment. So let us not be too quick to judge others for what they speak and what they do. So please learn this important lesson not to judge others. Thank you. you down and you feel more broken than whole when the wounds go deeper than words and you can't tell a soul I may not know what you're going through may not can make that high mountain move but one Whisper peace when your world gets shattered. If it's your greatest joy or your deepest pain, or you're really needing an answer, if it matters to you, it matters to the master. Whisper peace when your world gets shattered If it's 
We'd like to welcome each one of you for our worship once again. God has been good to us as we worship him, um, although we're in different places, I believe that God's spirit is with each one of us. A man was on death row. The time came when he was about to be executed, a life sentence. So the guards and the wardens come up to his room that day Although he was a criminal, they felt sorry for him. And in the custom in the prison, they came and asked him a question, what would you like to eat for your last meal? The man said, give me, uh, give me some time, let me think. So the barbers came and shaved his head. They brought in his tunics which he had to wear for his execution. And then he told them something which was very striking. He told them that for my last meal, I would like to have a fruit. And that fruit is the watermelon. The warden and the prison guards looked at each other and they turned to this prisoner and said, but we don't have watermelon during this year. The prisoner with a smile on his face said, well, I don't mind waiting. I don't mind waiting. Because it was in the month of winter. The prisoner had a little hope left. On his day, when he was going to be executed, he still clung on to that little hope he had left and said, I don't mind waiting till he gets to eat his last meal. Shall we all pray? Father in heaven, as we hear your word, make our hearts like the good soil. May it bring forth good things in Jesus' name. Amen. It was the year 2016. I just completed my bachelor's in theology and I am going to do my master's. I land in this beautiful place called Manila in the Philippines. The driver takes me to my college, which is called as IAS. I go and register myself, pay the fees, and there they take us for orientation. They take us around and show us the buildings, the gymnasium, they show us the ad building and our classrooms and everything else. And in this whole tour which took place for the whole day, they took us to the library. And this is what caught my attention. The librarians came, they showed us all the books, where it was stacked, neatly arranged. They took us to the first floor, the second floor. They showed us the computer lab inside. They showed us how we have to register, how to use the online books, and so on and so forth. But what really caught my attention was how the books were checked out. So the librarian there told us that in order for you to check out your books, you have to come to the reception. Scan your books by the person who's in charge there and then leave with the book outside the library. She said you can use the book, one book for two weeks and then return it back and then renew it and then take it back again. And this is what was there at the front doors of the library. 
There were two poles like that you see in an airport or in the malls. You have to pass through a scanner. So I asked her this question. What would happen if we went without checking out the books? She told me, sir, if you do that, there will be an alarm that will go off. The library will start beeping. Weeks passed, months passed, I never heard those sirens go off. So one day my roommate calls me up and tells me that he needs my help to take some books from the library. So he tells me that the books are on his cubicle to just take the books, put in the bag and leave. So I go find the books where he allots me to go. I take the books, put it in my bag and I'm on my way out. And guess what happened? After weeks and months of thinking what it would sound like, I exit the library and there I hear the sound. I hear the alarms going off in the library. I hear the beeping. And the beeping goes all throughout the library to the first floor, to the second floor. People have stopped what they are doing. People in the computer lab stand up and start to peep to see who has taken books without permission. Then I see the librarian approach me and she says, Sir, can you please come to the counter? With love, she says, can we see if you have checked out the books or not. I explain the situation to her and says, well, these are not my books, it's my, my roommates and he has asked me to take some books. She says, unfortunately, it was not checked out. So we get the books checked out and then I leave. At the appointed time, I heard the alarms go off. Everyone was staring at me to see who is this person, who is the culprit taking the books without permission. And the alarms went off. You can hear it all throughout the library, as loud as it can be. Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on earth had become, and that every inclination of thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on earth and his heart was filled with pain. When I read this verse, I can feel the sirens and the alarms going off. I can feel the stench of sin. Historians say it is no, not more than 1,600 years from the time of Adam to Noah. And God is already fed up. As how the Bible says, he is already grieved at man. I hear the alarms going off in this chapter. Sin has ricketed from star to star, from planet to planet, and it has come into the chambers of God, and the news of sin has made God upset and angry. Sin spreads through generations like a malignant cancer. It erases civilizations like a plague. Sin is not just a bad behavior, my friends. Sin is a broken relationship. Like a sledgehammer to a mirror, sin destroys and breaks the image of God. It shatters the image that God made man. And when I read this chapter, Genesis chapter 6, I hear glass pieces falling and breaking. I see sirens going off because all that God made is broken and come to a standstill. But we serve a God who always knows what to do. God has a plan in any situation. And this is what God does. God looks down and says, okay, it's time. It's time for me to recreate. And he looks at a man called as Noah. He tells Noah, 
the measurements of the ark. He gives him all the measurements and all the things he needs to do for building the ark. Noah goes and builds the most amazing ark the world has ever seen, made of gopher wood. William B. Walsh, maybe you have heard of him, but if you haven't, amazing story. William B. Walsh, a medical doctor, a heart specialist, he decides to do something creative, something that no one has ever done in the history of the world. He decides to make a boat, or he decides to have a boat. He wants to go into the world and spread God's work through medical ministry. So he talks to the president of the U.S. at that time. He tells him if he can have this medical ministry be done. People called this boat as a ship of fools. Some call this boat as a love boat. And this is what is interesting about what he did. He called volunteers to be a part of his ministry. He called volunteer nurses, doctors, where they went on this boat which is called as Hope. He named the boat as Hope. And he sailed all the way from San Francisco to Indonesia. Eleven voyages. All the way to Vietnam, to Peru, to Ecuador, to Colombia, to Brazil, and other places. People said that this boat will not succeed. This boat is a ship of fools. People have only heard about the smallpox at that time. They said, if you go into the world, if you go through your voyages, people will die. It's a dangerous plan. Don't do it. But Dr. William Walsh named that ship Hope and set sail from San Francisco and went all around the globe stretching to Indonesia, healing people from the illnesses they had. Was it a ship of fools? We can't say, but people concluded to say that it was a love boat. Noah does something similar. Noah builds the boat. He puts his family in, gets them in there, preaches God's word, people are not convinced, wickedness still rises like the sea level. The time has come, the doors are going to be shut, and bam, the doors are shut. The rains come down, the floodgates of the water bodies are opened. Noah and his family are there huddled in the ark, and they hear water for the first time raining down from heaven. They can feel the waves roar towards the ark. And there, the first slap of wave onto the boat, and the boat begins to float. Forty days and forty nights, they say, according to scriptures, it rained. But it was longer that Noah was in the ark. I've entitled my sermon this Sabbath as What Do You See? What Do You See? Noah was in the ark for more than days, more than a couple of weeks, more than months. Historians tell us that it was maybe more almost maybe a year that Noah was in the ark. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. I like to think that this was maybe the most traumatizing lockdown they ever faced 
all the animals there together all of noah's family members huddled together no place to go no escape route but they all are there in that piece of wood hearing that waves and the rain down on the ark and all they can hear is thunder and roaring noah decides to open the hatch of the ark let's go to genesis chapter 8 verses 6 and sometimes when the rains have stopped for 40 days and 40 nights the water is still there even when the rain is over the impact of the pain is still there sometimes the heartbreak is over but the impact and the scars that we face in our daily life is still so pricking that we can still feel it as if it is still happening and no way is there the rains have stopped but it is still there the impact is there the water is still on the earth and the question that they may be asking how long will this go on how long will this be when will we come to dry ground is there still hope and noah in this verse goes after 40 days and he opened the window he had made in the ark and the first bird noah sent into out of the ark was a raven he sent a raven and it kept flying back and forth until the water had dried up from the earth i read this verse and i don't see the raven coming back and he sent out a raven and it kept flying back and forth until the water had dried up from the earth noah opened the hatch of the ark and all he saw around him was water he saw water to his right to his left surrounded by water you ask noah what he saw he would say i saw nothing but water water all around him my believers today what do you see what do you see sometimes in life the ravens of our life don't come back there are some relationships that you have mentored for so long some relationship that you have invested so much of time in so much of money so much of emotions in and sometimes the relationship that you have kept together for so long does not come back sometimes people don't come back like this raven sometimes situations memories that you have longed to have fades away and become dry just like this raven noah decides to send out another bird genesis chapter 8 and verses 3 the waters receded we go to verses 9 8 onwards 8 and 9 he says that Noah sent out a dove to see if the water had receded from the surface of the ground but the dove could find no place to set its feet because there was water over all the surface of the earth so he returned to the ark what a sad thing he sends a raven now he sends a dove the raven doesn't come back the dove comes back because it doesn't find any place to lay its feet let's go on verse 10 he waited for seven more days and again sent out the dove from the ark but this time the dove returned to him in the evening there in his beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf I can almost picture Noah standing there near the hatch near the window all day he has sent the dove but the dove hasn't returned 
And almost when the sun is about to set, set on the earth, set on his feelings, set on Noah's hopes, he sees the fluttering noise once again. But this time, he sees a dove. But not just that. He sees a freshly plucked olive branch in the beak of the dove. Oh, what a relief. What a relief. It's amazing what the Bible compares a dove to. Read the scriptures from the Old Testament and all through the New. What does a dove represent to us? Dove is pictured or symbolized as the Holy Spirit in the Bible. But not just that. I'm here to tell you, believers today, when Noah opened the window, for a moment he saw water. The next moment he saw a dove. He saw an olive branch. An olive branch means peace. An olive branch means hope. An olive branch means something which brings our feelings, our emotions to a standstill. When you look at it, it brings happiness and joy to our souls. It means there is still some hope left. And when Noah saw these leaves, olive leaves, in the beak of this dove, he gladly received it. I'm here to tell you, believers in Christ, that Jesus is our olive branch. When the stench of sin was rising higher and higher, Jesus had a plan to come down into our sin-wretched place, into our world to redeem each one of us. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son and he keeps giving to each one of us. God is a God that gives and gives and he always keeps giving till a cup overflows. Jesus is our olive branch. Jesus extends that leaf to each one of us when we lost all hope. When hope was running dry, Jesus comes like a freshly plucked olive branch into our world. He comes into our world to bring hope. I don't know what you're going through at this time. Maybe it's anxiety. Maybe you can't see further than the wall. Maybe you do not know what is there on the other side. Maybe fear has gripped you. Or maybe it's anxiety. Or maybe it's just feelings you can't comprehend. Doubt possibly has overwhelmed your heart. Doubt is not getting answers. Doubt is something that when you get the answers for the questions that you have been thinking, it is still doubting the answers that has been given to you by God. And Jesus comes to us as our olive branch. And Noah, he welcomes that dove. He welcomes that dove with a smile on his face. He knows that there is still hope left. He knows that there is still hope left. What is worse than losing your way is losing hope. Because losing your way is something physical. But when you lose all hope, you lose your identity, you lose your spiritual walk with God, you lose sense of everything that God has called you to be. For we have something that is deeper than what the world gives us. And that is the blessed hope that the doves of our lives brings to us in situations of fear. Twenty sixteen. It was semester break. 
when I was studying in Philippines, a few group of us friends decide to go uh, and explore the country. So we go to this island, which is called as Palawan, one of the most beautiful islands I have visited. So we set, set uh, our minds to go, we pack our bags, we fly to this island of Palawan. We decided to go island hopping. The people who are in charge come, get our boats ready. When we see out into the weather, the sky, the sky is gloomy. We come to know that we can't go anymore to the islands that we planned to go because the weather was not good. So we ask the people in charge there, the, the boatmen and the local heads, is there anywhere else we can go because we have come so far, we want to go and see these islands. They said, yes, you can still go to some islands which are on the other side. You can still visit. So we went to a place called as Port Barton. Oh, beautiful. We went snorkeling. We jumped into the ocean with our life jackets. Two boats, 21 of us, 10 on each boat. We spent the whole day on this Port Barton. The sea was blue. Some of us saw beautiful fish. We went deep down inside. We saw those coral reef. Wow, amazing. The boat in charge, the man came and said, I think it's time you have to go back to shore because um, there's a storm setting in. You know, we all were so excited. We didn't listen to him. Most of our friends were still there in the water. Sun was about to set. Clouds were looming in, but still we were there in the water. We didn't want to come out. It was so beautiful. Nothing that we have seen before or have we experienced. We said we have come so far, we still want to enjoy just for a little more time. The man says, no, you have to come right away. The storm is setting in. It is so bad that sometimes we have to go soon. If not, we might be stranded in sea or stuck on this island. So we pack our bags quickly, dry ourselves, get on the boats, and we set sail back to shore. You won't believe. It was the most dreadful trip I have ever taken on a boat. Wow. We were passing through a storm. Ten of us on each boat. The rain was coming on our faces. The wind was beating against our chest. It was so cold. We all huddled together with our wet towels, with our wet clothes. We put it together, trying to come together to keep each other warm. The waves were tossing and turning. And we all were screaming. And we all were praying. All we wanted to see was dry land. All we wanted to see was just some light over the horizon. After a couple of hours, we saw a small light. It became bigger and bigger. And there, after two and a half hours, we reached shore. I don't know about you, but maybe you're having a similar experience right now. Maybe all you can see is water, and maybe all you can see is a storm. And maybe God is sending doves into your life just to show you that there is still some hope. It was in the month of May last year that my wife and I decided to go on a trip. We got married in April, and after the hustle was over of the marriage, after the music faded away and after all the functions and everything was done, we thought to just spend some time with ourselves, just the two of us, as what young lovers call it today as a honeymoon. So we decided to go to, um, to Goa, haven't been there. So we plan our trip in such a way that we go to Goa. On our way back, we come by ship. The ship was called as uh, Angria. A ship service which just started a few uh, years ago. Wow, my first time on a ship. 
As for my wife, beautiful ship. We came out in the evening, we sat on the dock, we came to see how everything was going on. We saw the sun rise, we saw the sun set. The breeze was so cool. People, couples, children, family members, everyone came out. The captain came, gave me a binocular to see, and he was pointing out to an island to see how beautiful it is. We came out in the night, we sat on the sofa there, we looked up into the starry skies in the night, spent the midnight out there in the fresh air, looking up into the sky and thanking God for his blessings. What a beautiful experience. I don't think Noah experienced that. Noah had a very different experience. What do you do when you're bogged down, when you're tied down to something that you have never experienced before? Sometimes God takes you into unfamiliar territory to teach us some things that we never experienced in familiar territory. Water was something that was new to the time of Noah. They've never seen rain, no floods before. And God takes Noah and his whole family to experience something out of his comfort zone, to teach him and to show him something as well, that God is still in control, that God provides. God provided an ark for such a time as that. The disciples huddled together in Acts chapter 2, verses 2. Jesus promised them something amazing, which is found in John 14, 26. Jesus says, I am sending you the comforter, and when the comforter comes, you will be at peace. We see the fulfillment in Acts chapter 2, verses 2. All the disciples are there. They hear a roaring noise. The Holy Spirit descends on each one of them. And they all were filled by the Holy Spirit. If your hopes have come dry, if you have lost your way, Jesus is our olive branch. And he doesn't stop there. He sends his comforter, the Holy Spirit, to lead us into all truth, to search our hearts and to give us hope for a future. It was last year when a group of us from Lowry were traveling from Bangalore to Surat for the Youth Congress, division-wide. 20, 20 of us sat in the train traveling. It was night. We had our worship in the train. We all slept. I slept on the side berth. Around 4.30 in the morning, I woke up with haste. I woke up with haste and the first thing that I noticed that my pocket is torn. My pocket has a cut and I reach out to see if my purse is there but my purse is lost. My purse is gone. I jump up. I look around. I felt something but I didn't see anyone yet. I run down the alley to see if there was anyone there. I call my friends and the leaders who were there, I tell them, someone has stolen my wallet. A big cut in the front pocket. I usually keep my pocket in the front, I keep my wallet in the front pocket usually to be safe. I run out, check on the platform, no one is there. I come to terms that someone has cut open and taken my wallet. At 5 o'clock in the morning, I called the call center, block all my cards, lost a bunch of money, lost my ATM cards, lost my driving license. And after two hours of reporting everything, after two hours of coming to terms with me having lost my wallet, 
I don't know what prompts me. I go back on my knees. I look down under this, the seat for one last time to just check and see if maybe by mistake the person who took my wallet just left it there by mistake. I just had a little hope left. For one last time, I went and checked again. Maybe it must have been there. The enemy comes to us when we're sleeping. The enemy comes to us at our most vulnerable time. Sometimes the enemy doesn't come to us when we have just heard a week of prayer sermon. He comes to us sometimes when we are spiritually down, when we are in grief, when we are in fear, when we are gripped with sadness. I was telling my friends, I wish I was awake so I could fight him. And someone said, oh no, these guys are trained. They're trained to do what they do. I went down on my knees for one last time to see if maybe there was still a little bit hope left. Believers, we are living in a time where we are, don't have the luxury of losing any hope. I will tell you what I see. When I read the book of Revelation, Revelation is not just an apocalyptic book, but Revelation is a book of homecomings. Revelation is a book where I see Jesus wiping away every tear. I don't see only water. I don't see just fear. But I see Jesus wiping away every tear. I see Jesus wiping away death. I see Jesus wiping away sadness and fear and all those emotions which grip you. I see Jesus wiping away all those things. I don't know about you, but for another time in history, I hear the sirens once again, church members. I hear the alarms go off because the stench of sin has got hold of God's attention once again. The alarms are blazing. Sirens are growing louder and louder. And for once again, I feel that sin has got God's attention in the chambers of heaven. We are living in a time where we can't afford to lose hope because Jesus is our olive branch. Jesus sends his Holy Spirit to comfort us and to bring us that hope that we have lost, to bring us a hope that we have been waiting for. And we all are waiting for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, I will send you the comforter. I will send you. I don't stop being the olive branch, but I will send you another comforter who will be hope for your dying souls. As we live our lives and as we read God's scripture, may God be with us. We don't have the luxury to lose hope because Jesus is our olive branch and Jesus brings hope to each one of us. Neil Armstrong, when he set his foot on moon for the first time, he said, this was a small step for man, but a giant leap for mankind. Just like how he put his foot for the first time on the moon, Noah once again steps on dry ground after months of waiting in the ark. And up there he sees a promise, a promise of hope, a rainbow, that I will not do this once again. Because there is always hope. Because our hope is built on nothing less. It's built on Jesus' blood and his righteousness.
And as we keep these words in mind, may we always be reminded that no matter what comes our way, no matter what goes around us in our world, that our hope is steadfast and our hope is built on Jesus Christ. Shall we all invite Jesus as we pray? Father in heaven, we want to build our hope on you. We want to build our hope in Jesus. Because sometimes the ravens of life don't come back, but we know that the doves that you send always stay with us. Your Holy Spirit was meant to come and never go away. Send us your Spirit, just like how you came, that we may never lose hope in this dying world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to fill his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, all may again in him be found, clad in his righteousness alone. Faultless to stand before the throne On Christ the solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking sand All